this captioning is available by clicking the three dots, it should say there, um, at the top on the taskbar. Um, but if you're not sure about it, then say in the chat and I can guide you through it. Um, if you have an issue during the session, please use the chat function to not interrupt the speakers. Um, and feel free to ask your questions in the chat function. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in from, and if you want to tweet about it or any social media, then we've got a couple of hashtags, which is hashtag DIL and hashtag the Doctor College. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen because uh, our first speaker, Rosie, is going to share hers and share her presentation that way. Um, so I'm going to hand over to the Dean of Doctor College, Professor David Lambert, um, and he can do a bit of an introduction. So thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kelly. Uh, good evening, everybody. I was just saying before a lot of you arrived that you know it's been a long day of meetings, and this is the only one I've been really looking forward to. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to introduce these, but it but it is going to be a bit different for us. Um, I would normally be saying um, it's great to see so many of you, but actually I can't see that many of you, and there are quite a few people here. And I can't see you uh, face to face, and I will be saying at the end of the lecture. Let's all go out and have a glass of wine and uh, and uh, and a bit of a chat. Sadly, you'll have to do that um, on your own. Uh, raise a glass to the speakers. These, these things really are the, the kind of highlight of the, of the PGI year for us. They're highly competitive. Um, the colleges have usually have quite a big pool to select from, so to, you know to be shortlisted is great, but actually to make it is a is a real. Uh, a real accolade and something for your CV. And some of the lectures that we've heard over the last years have been truly outstanding. They will put some professorial in all the lectures to shame. So um, the bar is set very high, but we've got two um, really great speakers today, and they're both on a space theme. And I, kind of, I was kind of thinking to myself that actually um, Rosie is in space looking out and Peter's in space looking in and it's all kind of all kind of fits really nicely so i'm not going to prattle on for too long um i'm going to invite um dr rosie johnson to give her doctoral novel lecture entitled jupiter's northern light so rosie it's over to you thank you for that introduction i'm gonna start sharing my screen now OK, so at any point, if this screen sharing doesn't work, please let me know and um, I'll sort that out. Um, so thank you for that introduction and thank you for inviting me here to give this doctoral inaugural lecture. It's been a bit of a trip down memory lane um, looking into my thesis, trying to remember what I did. Um, but I'm going to talk to you today about Jupiter's Northern Lights. So this is an image that I took of the um, infrared telescope facility in Hawaii. Um, it's a long exposure image and I use the torch to write Team H3+. So I think the telescope shutters look like they're closed. So this was around dawn after Tom and Henrik and I had done some observing. So we're probably off down the hill to get some breakfast or maybe some dinner and then um, go to bed. So just a bit of background into Jupiter's um, system for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Jupiter's magnetic field is huge. So the Earth's magnetosphere, which is the bubble that surrounds the planet that's dominated by the planet's magnetic field, that can actually fit inside of Jupiter itself, as you can see from this schematic. Jupiter has a volcanic moon called Io, and Io produces about one ton per second of material. And this um, fills up Jupiter's magnetosphere and its plasma. Um, the magnetic field lines are frozen into this plasma. So close to Jupiter, the magnetic field and the plasma is rotating around with the planet. So that's about once every 10 hours. But as you move away from the planet the, um, to conserve angular momentum, the angular velocity of the plasma and the magnetic field lines, they have to, um, that has to fall. At first, ion neutral collisions in the ionosphere, which is the charged upper part of Jupiter's atmosphere, they work to speed up the magnetic field lines. But eventually, as you move away from the planet, the plasma and the magnetic field lines, they just can't keep up anymore. So they lag behind the rotation rate of the planet. 
And this sets up a current system. So over here, you can see in the schematic, the current system, the current comes out of the ionosphere along the magnetic field lines through the current sheet and then back down along the magnetic field lines, going back into the ionosphere at a higher latitude. And then the current closes with equatorial Peterson currents. So this is how we understand Jupiter's northern lights and Jupiter's southern lights to be created. So during my PhD, I observed Jupiter um, in the infrared and I looked at the northern lights um, at a wavelength of about four microns. So this is an image of Jupiter here in at about four microns. And um, the bulk of the emission at this wavelength is from a molecule called H2+. And H2 plus is the simplest polyatomic molecule. So it produces its emissions through forbidden rho vibrational transmissions. Um, and away from the polar regions, the H2 plus is created by ionization from extreme ultraviolet radiation. And at the polar regions, it's created from ionization that causes a, a chain reaction process that, um, is by particle precipitation. So you can see in this image, there's a lot more H3 plus, it's a lot brighter um, in the aurora regions. So to um, take the data, we use two spectrometers. One is CryRes at the Very Large Telescope in Chile, and the other is Seashell, and that's at the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility in Hawaii. That's the telescope that was pictured at the start of this presentation. So what we do is we um, point the telescope at Jupiter and position it so that the slit is at the top of Jupiter's pole. So I've drawn this uh, white line here to represent the slit. And then we step that sequentially through the auroral regions so we can take data from the whole region. We also include a jump to the equatorial regions. So this is an example of all the spectral emission lines that you can get um, from H plus when you use the cryo-res instrument that's at the Very Large Telescope in Chile. So from those emission lines, we can derive a number of properties. So this is an example of an H plus emission line. So I've orientated it because it's a slice through the auroral region. So by fitting a Gaussian to every spatial position along this line, we can work out the spectral intensity. And you can see that here in the plot below. So this dashed grey line, we're coming in from the, um, the dawn side of the planet through one part of the main auroral emission across the polar aurora to the other side of the main auroral emission and then down off um, the dust glim of the planet. We can work out the line of sight velocity of the H2 plus ions in Jupiter's ionosphere by um, relating the spectral resolution of the instrument to the Doppler shift of the H2 plus line. So you can see that this line, it's not completely straight relative to the horizontal dash line. Um, and that's due to the large rotation rate of the planet and um, one side moving towards the observer, the other side moving away. And also to do uh, this Doppler shift relating to the ionospheric flows in the aurora region. So in this plot, you can see the blue line is the line of sight velocities of the H2 plus in the magnetic pole reference frame. So these velocities are relative to Jupiter's magnetic pole. And then the black line here, this is in the um, planetary reference frame. So that rotation rate of the planet has been removed. We can also work out the temperature. So here you can see that um, the Q1 emission and the Q3 emission, um, which are two different um, emission lines of H2 plus. Q3 is actually brighter than Q1. So by taking the ratio of these two emission lines, we can work out the rotational temperature of um, the H2 plus, And that's in this red line here. And we can also work out the condensity and total emission. So the first study that I undertook during my PhD was investigating uh, Jupiter's equatorial flows. Now, I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit disappointed to be studying the equator because, as I showed you before, the H2 plus emission at the um, mid to low latitudes, that's very uniform. But in the far ultraviolet um, emission, there's actually a bright spot in the mid to low latitudes. 
Um, so in this schematic here, you can see where the grey contour lines, this is the position of what is known as the H Lyman alpha bulge. Now, to explain how this bulge is created, Sumera et al. in 1995 created a model of some neutral flows, and these are overlaid um, with the red arrows there. So they suggested, what this model suggests is that there's flows of about 10 to 20 kilometers per second in that region. Now, in the aurora regions, um, Schofer et al. showed that there's a coupling between the iron and the neutral winds. Um, so if this coupling exists at the equator, then you would expect that if the neutrals are moving that fast, then the H root plus would also be affected. So no one had actually taken any measurements of the H root plus velocity at the uh, mid to low latitude region. So I took a data set that Tom had taken um, with the using the seashell instrument at the NASA infrared telescope facility. And I derived line of sight velocities from that data set. So I couldn't find any evidence of strong flows in the H true plus at the position of the H Lyman alpha bulge. And you can see over here on the right hand side, I have the line, the average line of sight velocity for 1999. 2007 and 2013. So the red line is the line of co-rotation. So if they have, if the ions have a zero velocity, then they're rotating around with the planet. And the black line is the derived line of side velocities of the H plus ion. So you can see that within the bounds of the experimental error, which is shown by the gray shaded region, that the H plus ions are actually just rotating around with the planet. So this means that the Smera et al. model may need revisiting, or it could be that the ions and the neutrals just don't have the same coupling as in the aurora regions. What it does mean, though, is that any deviation from co-rotation seen in the H plus line of sight velocities in the aurora regions, that would be caused by the ion um, the ionosphere magnetosphere coupling current system. So then I moved on to studying Jupiter's northern lights. In 2001 to 2003, a couple of papers by um, Tom Stallard showed a region of Jupiter's northern aurora that was stationary. So this is a line of sight velocity profile taken of um, a section. So you can see where the slit was positioned across the northern aurora. And it was found that this region here, which is coincident in the UV with the swirl region. So this is an image of the UV aurora. This was thought to be coupled to the um, solar wind through open magnetic field lines. So here's a schematic from Cowley et al. in 2003. And what they thought was that the magnetic field lines here are convecting so slowly across the polar aurora compared to all the other magnetic field lines that are either um, co-rotating or sub-rotating. They're, move, they're moving so slowly that the H2 plus ions seem stationary here. However, Delamere and Bagnall in 2010 thought that this wouldn't, that they would be coupled through closed magnetic field lines. Because if it was open, then there shouldn't really be any aurora in this region. Um, but you do see aurora there. And they thought this could be because the closed magnetic field lines um, are coupling to this Kelvin Helmholtz instability layer, where lots of little um, turbulence are causing small scale reconnection. And this is making aurora there. So it wasn't a clear picture, and um, we decided to investigate this further. Um, on the 31st of December in 2012, Tom took some data using the CryRes instrument, um, which is at the Very Large Telescope in Chile. And this data set has got a much higher spatial and spectral resolution. So this is the average spectral intensity for that evening's observations. And I've projected it onto um, the northern hemisphere of Jupiter. Then I derived the line of sight velocity of the H plus ions and made those into projections too. So you can see here is the line of sight velocity in the planetary reference frame. So that's got the planet's rotation rate removed. 
and in the magnetic pole reference frame, which is all relative to the magnetic pole, but you can still see here the large values due to the planet's rotation rate. And I've created a schematic to try and help us understand what's going on here. So the first thing I'd like to highlight is a super rotating flow, which is along the main auroral emission here. This is the narrow part, now bright part of Jupiter's aurora. Now, um, we weren't exactly expecting super rotating flows. However, some models have shown the thermosphere to be super rotating. So it could be speeding up the H2 plus ions, or it could be these H2 plus ions mapped to um, magnetic field lines that were stretched out into the night side of Jupiter. But then as they come round to the day side, they get squashed by the magnetopause. So their angular velocity is increasing and maybe this is taking them to pass co-rotation so that they're actually super rotating, going faster. Um, but we don't really know. So the shear between this strong super rotating flow and then this counter flow, which is poleward, the, the peak in the shear is actually poleward of the peak in the main auroral emission intensity. And that was predicted by Nichols and Cowley in 2004. Furthermore, on this side of the aurora, this region of subrotating H2 plus ions, that's also in agreement with our current understanding of how the aurora is generated. So next, moving on to the stationary regions of H2 plus ions. So Stallard et al. found that in this dot dashed region here, that's also coincidence with the UV swirl region, that's where they found the stationary region. However, with this higher spatial and spectral resolution data, we found the stationary region to be coincident with this uh, dark blue region. So you can see in the data over here, it's that white bit there. So it's stationary relative to everything else, which is either sub-rotating, co-rotating, or actually, in fact, super-rotating as well. Um, and so now that it's coincident with the region that's it's dark in the infrared and ultraviolet, so that makes further supports the argument put forward by Cowley that um, this region is coupled to the solar wind through open magnetic field lines. But until we have spacecraft data going through the magnetic field lines at the same time as measuring these atmospheric flows, we can't say for sure what the um, exact mechanism of the coupling is. However, I do happen to possess such a data set, so <laughs> hopefully we can watch this space and see what happens with that. So after doing the line of sight um, velocities, I moved on to the H2 plus temperature. And so for the same evening of observations, I derived the total emission of line of sight velocities, which I showed you just now, and column density and the average temperature. So we wanted to understand the structures that we saw in the temperature. We wondered if the heating was driven by uh, dual heating. So if you assume that the neutral atmosphere is co-rotating, you're going to have the greatest amount of dual heating where the largest values of line of sight velocity exist. So by comparing these polar projections, the largest flows are here and maybe along the main auroral uh, emission. And if you compare that to the temperature, it's kind of hot over there, but on this side of the aurora, maybe it's not as clear. H2 plus is referred to as a thermostat as it's really efficient at re-radiating auroral energy into space. So if H2 plus has been a really efficient thermostat, then where the total emission is high, it should be that the temperature is low. And we definitely don't see that over here on the narrow bright side of the aurora. But um, maybe there is some evidence of that over here. Again, not a clear picture. Could the heating be driven by particle precipitation? So the column density gives us an idea of where the particle precipitation is happening because it gives us an idea of where the greatest amount of ionization is and where the most H plus is being made. So by comparing these two um, projections, you can see that maybe over here on the narrow bright part of the aurora where the column density is high, the temperature is also high. But again, the picture is less clear on the other side. So perhaps not surprisingly, it seems that there must be an interplay between all of these heating mechanisms. <laughs> 
On further investigation, I found some temperature changes in Jupiter's oh, across the observation, so across a short time scale. Here's the average temperature at the start and the end of the night. Over here on the right hand side, you can see that this region moves from hotter to colder, and in the center of the polar aurora, it moves from colder to hotter. So could this be that we're sampling different altitudes at different local times? And we don't have very much data on the vertical profile, a uh, vertical temperature profile of Jupiter's ionosphere. Um, but the general picture is it's getting hotter as we're getting higher. So Haitian plus peak emission altitude is at about 1,500, but a kilometers above the one bar level. But of course, it emits at a wide range of altitudes. So. For example, if we look at this hot this region here, um, it moves from hotter. So maybe at that local time, the electron precipitation is soft, and the H plus ions are being made high up in the altitude. Altitude, sorry, in the atmosphere where it's um, hotter, and then as it rotates to a new local time, maybe the electrons precipitating down there, maybe they're harder, so H2 plus is getting made lower down in the atmosphere um, where it's cooler. Or it could be the neutral atmosphere is driving changes in the temperature. So here on the top right hand side, I've got um, a model from Yates et al, which is showing that the thermosphere can respond dynamically to a transient solar wind compression. So we had a look to see if there was any solar wind compression squashing Jupiter's magnetosphere at the time of the observations. And we found that it could maybe overlap with the start of a um, compression. So it could be that the thermosphere is driving these changes. But again, we don't know exactly what the process is that are going on here. So in conclusion, the mid to low latitude ionosphere is co-rotating, which is good news for our current understanding of the generation of the aurora. I identified several flows in the northern aurora. I identified a super-rotating flow, which is a bit of a mystery, and a couple of the other flows proved um, again, our current understanding of the aurora generation is correct. And then I found the stationary region is now coincident with the UV dark region, which is also dark in the infrared. And I also discovered some temperature changes over short time scales in Jupiter's northern aurora. So outstanding questions and future work. I don't think I have time to go into all of these. Um, questions, but I just wanted to highlight that um, during my PhD, I was successfully awarded four observing proposals. Um, I, they had four successful awarding, <laughs> uh, observed Jupiter for 75 hours during my PhD. And here are some of the results. And we observed Jupiter at the same time Juno was in the solar wind and also while Juno was orbiting Jupiter. And um, that's a really good cool data set that I would love to explore further. I know some of my colleagues have already got started on it. And also, even though I'm not currently in academia, um, I am trying to work with one of my PhD friends to work out the true velocity vector of the H2 plus flows using some methods that they use on Earth. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So thank you so much for listening and thank you for giving me this opportunity to um, give a doctoral and normal lecture. I want to take this opportunity to thank my supervisors, Tom and Johnny, and also a big shout out to Henrik and generally the rest of RSPP for all of your help and super fun times during my PhD. And um, so I'd welcome any questions from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think a virtual round of applause, it's not, not, not quite the same, but um, a virtual round of applause anyway. Um, really interesting talk, and uh, and I think if it wasn't for the Hawaiian shirt, I probably wouldn't have recognised Tom in the, uh, in the last picture, but, but, but there we go. Does anybody have some questions? I know it's going to be difficult, but please don't be shy. If you have some questions... Um, just shout out. That's probably the best thing. And I'll wait 30 seconds before I ask my question. <laughs> 
Virtual round of applause. Jason's managed a virtual round of applause. All right, then. So um, I, I always find my claim to fame is failing A-level physics, but I actually loved space. It was something that I really, really enjoyed. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the images that you that you were taking and that you were looking at effectively are for something that no longer exists, right? So the images are from the past? Um, not with Jupiter, because Jupiter's actually close enough to us that it doesn't take as long for the light to come. So you would be correct if we were taking images of like stars and galaxies, but the light doesn't take as long. So they're from the past. I don't know how long it takes light to get Jupiter. If anyone knows, please put I, it in I, the chat. I'm going to guess. I, 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 haven't, I haven't a clue. So is it like, is it? So 30 what? minutes, there we are. 30, 30, minutes, 30, 30 minutes. minutes from the past. <laughs> so, so 30 minutes in the past. So so presumably, what's the overall kind of aim or relevance of what, you, what you're what you doing? So say so you've showed some really nice data about, about atmospheric um, differences as, as you get higher up the atmosphere, it gets warmer and, and you've shown some quite nice stuff on that. What's What's the end game for this? So we so we now know about Jupiter's northern lights. What what can we actually do with it practically? I think um, when we're looking at the outer planets, it gives us a really good opportunity um, to kind of change the um, like. So when you're doing an experiment in a lab, you would change the conditions. But with planets, we've only got the Earth and we've only got Jupiter. So you can't really change those conditions so if we only studied the earth then um we wouldn't know as much if that makes sense and at the moment it's well it'll be it's really important to be studying space weather so the effect of the solar wind which is continuously coming from the sun and so if we study that effect and how it um interacts with jupiter this in general, gives us more understanding of how it affects um, us on the Earth. And I guess, you know, for the future, if you ever wanted to visit Jupiter, it'd just be a really great idea to know what's going on there. So, <laughs> I don't know whether I've frozen or whether David's frozen, but I'm going to go ahead and answer a question in the chat if that's okay okay is davis frozen so if you can still hear me um peter said how difficult is it to get observation time and how long do you need to wait to get an application approved um i think it was quite difficult um i can't remember they used to tell you like um how many competitors you had um um so I don't know, maybe Tom or Henrik can write in the chat how difficult it is because they used to tell you. But um you so you would like write the observing proposal there was like two per year, and then you would write before Christmas or like at the end of the summer, and then like after Christmas, so a month at least, you'd have to wait while they looked at it and then um it would be approved and then whenever you sort of had scheduled your observations for then you could start so i know in other um astronomy disciplines quite a lot of time when you um want to observe something it goes like in a queue and then they just observe it for you whenever there's a, a weather window but with our observations um we pretty much did everything the telescope operator didn't really do much um, except we'd be like, oh, please, can you put it on Jupiter? But in the end, like when me and Tom and Henrik were observing, we would have to, um, we ended up even tracking and guiding on stars. So um, we had to step the slit down through the planet, which, of course, we had a, a computer program, a macro to do. Um, but, yeah, so it was quite complex observing. But, yeah, Tom just said of oh, over subscription of telescope is in between two to ten times so i was in the top 50 to 10 percent of all professional observations 
Yeah, well, I am actually really proud that I got that much telescope <laughs> time and it was the best part of the PhD, for sure. Um, so I'm back. Kelly's back. <laughs> um, I felt like I was <laughs> running it there for a moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet you must have thought we'd all just gone. Um, so I'm just going to check. Does anybody and I'm back on now. Right. I, okay. I feel like... I think- the rest of them are trying to come back in as well. Um, can anyone give us a nudge in the chat if you're still there? Um, Did everyone leave? I'm still here, Kelly. Okay, cool. Because um, my my internet completely dropped, and I was just like, what's going on? Ah, oh, fabulous. You guys are also here. Uh, Dave, that was just me and you then. What? Uh, it was, uh, I think my I think my internet had gone to Jupiter for asking me <laughs> asking the in the past question. That's probably what it is. <laughs> um, that was so strange. Okay, right, yeah. So, um, uh, so Peter's talk is a video which I'm going to start sharing now. So if the internet drops, oh my god, I'm so sorry, but we'll solve it. Um, so Dave, I don't know if you want to just do a short introduction. So, so is Peter's not here, right? Yeah, he's here. Peter's here. Um, but I'm just going to share his video. Ah, so you're going to share, you're going to start with it. So, so Kelly's going to play the video and then we're going to ask some questions at the end of it, right? Yes, but give me Okay, a so this is, this is, um, Peter Sean Cootie. I hope I've got that right. Um, Great. And we're Great. going, and we're going from looking out now to looking in. That's right. So I'm really looking forward to the next inaugural lecture, which is going to be Peter. So, Peter, the floor, or rather the screen, is all yours. Um, Thank you. Good evening, good afternoon, good evening. I guess it depends on where you are right now. I want to thank the University of Leicester and the College, of course, for inviting me and giving me this very interesting opportunity to talk about some of the research that I've done as a PhD student at the University of Leicester and the Earth Observation Science Group. I'm obviously quite sad that I couldn't be here in person. International travel is a little bit tricky right now. Nevertheless, I hope that in the next 20 minutes or so, you will find a little bit of entertainment um, in this presentation, and I hope that you might learn a thing or two. So let us dive right in. What we see here is a bit of a big picture, and I want to start with the big picture. Here you see Earth, um, a little animation done using images taken from a meteorological weather satellite. Um, My research revolved mostly around the topic of carbon. We know that carbon as an element is present in all forms of life that we know of so far, and therefore it is unsurprisingly a topic of quite intense research, and it can take on many different forms. We can find carbon in many different locations. Carbon is in our oceans, it's in our forests, and all types of vegetation, really. You can find it in our soil, you can find it in rocks. And at the end of the day, it is, of course, also in the air that we breathe. So it's also present in the atmosphere. Carbon doesn't just stay in those pools, so these pools being you know, global vegetation or global atmosphere, um, but it also moves around them between various pools. And if you look at that those carbon movements on a very global scale and a global point of view, and then you end up in a research topic that we know of as carbon cycle science. So on the right-hand side here, you see a somewhat simplistic, but I think very effective um, little schematic of the global carbon cycle. You see those boxes represent those global carbon pools, such as the atmosphere or vegetation or soils. And then we have arrows, and those arrows, those wiggly lines, um, they represent the various movements of carbon between those boxes and those pools. Uh, The numbers in the brackets can tell you the total amount of carbon in the atmosphere, for example. And if you look at those arrows, the numbers in brackets there tell you how much carbon is being moved around. Uh, The numbers aren't that important right now. all you really have to understand is that carbon moves from one place to another. We know, for example, from school that plants have the ability to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. This is something called photosynthesis, here a little bit cryptically called primary production. And what this essentially does is plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, turn them into sugars and starches, 
and those sugars and starches then become little energy reserves for plants. Um, less common knowledge is that plants also exhale carbon um, because they are living beings, they are living things, so they have to fuel their metabolism on a very cellular level. So they take those energy reserves and then burn those energy reserves to do their basic metabolic things. And then in that, during that process, they also exhale carbon. And it turns out that, that those two processes, i.e. taking carbon out of the atmosphere and then exhaling it whenever they need to, on a global scale, those are almost in balance. Um, we see, looking at those numbers, that plants in a given year take up a little more carbon dioxide than they exhale again, which is good for us because it, it removes a little bit of that excess carbon dioxide uh, that we put out. In this diagram, you can also see the two of the major human contributions to the global carbon cycle. One of them here, little strangely called net land use change. What that really means is when we cut down forests to, for example, make room for cattle, um, we essentially remove the, the ability of the biosphere to, to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere just a little bit. And that is represented in this number. And then, of course, we have the, the most major component of the human part of carbon cycle is burning fossil fuels. So we dig up fossil fuels from the ground and then burn them in internal combustion engines. So carbon cycle, it's really a question of how much carbon is there in the various pools? Uh, where does it come from? Where does it go? And a more important question really is after we've established these numbers to, you know, a certain accuracy that we're not totally happy with, but, but you know, it is what it is. Um, we really want to know how do these numbers change throughout various seasons, throughout various years. Um, and of course, the, the really big question is how do these numbers change um, when we know that we are living in a changing climate? So are these numbers going to look similar in 50 years, 100 years? Are they going to be drastically different? So how do we do carbon cycle science in a more practical way? Um, so there are a couple of interesting and fancy and creative ways of figuring out those carbon exchanges um, simply by knowing the atmospheric content. So we know the atmospheric content of carbon dioxide on various places on Earth. Then what we also need to know is the wind direction and the wind speed at these places and at those times. And then you do some kind of a fancy backwards calculation because you think, you know, you have a pocket of carbon dioxide and it's been, you know, we can measure it here. We know the wind has taken it from here. So we can say, okay, it's probably been emitted over here or it has been absorbed over there. And in order to do that, we need to know the carbon dioxide or CO2 concentrations. Uh, how do we know the concentrations? That's kind of an easy but tedious part. You hire lots of students, you tell them to take a bottle, hold the breath, open up the plug, collect some air, put the plug back on, and then bring it back to the lab. And in the lab, we can do chemical analysis. This will tell us the CO2 concentration um, to a very high degree of accuracy. And, you know, and then there's people running these computer simulations that we need to do for these backwards calculations. And they take on all of these measurements from all over the globe and different times. And they, then they come up with a global picture of those carbon exchanges. Um, about 20 years ago, people started asking questions about, well, could we do this from space? Because it's kind of tedious to just have people measure those carbon dioxide concentrations um, all over the planet. And just one of those um, rather important scientific publications, I've just put two figures up here on the left, um, done by Peter Rayner and Dennis O'Brien. And they were one of the first ones, probably one of the more important ones, that, that have investigated the question. And they really tried to answer the question, well, if we had those carbon dioxide concentration measurements from space all over the planet, could this really help us understand the global carbon cycle better than we do now? And their answer was yes, this would indeed um, help us improve our knowledge. Yeah, on this slide, you see a computer simulation, a very nice 
high resolution, high temporal, high spatial resolution computer simulation. So this is not the truth, but it, it gives you a very, very good idea of how carb carbon dioxide is distributed on the planet and especially how it moves around the planet. Um, so you can see all these almost chaotic swirly patterns and that's just how wind works on a global scale and that's how gases are transported around the planet. And what you really need to understand with this animation is that carbon dioxide on a global scale, there is about 400 parts per million um, of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, roughly. And what that means is taking a million molecules of air somewhere on the planet, you'll see that about 400 of those million molecules will be carbon dioxide molecules. So first of all, it is not a large amount that we're looking for. That's why they're really called trace gases, because there are small amounts of them in the atmosphere. Another really important point is that if we want to take measurements from space, <clears throat> and if we want to make these measurements useful for scientists that then try to figure out those carbon exchanges, we need to make sure that using those measurements, we can really um, understand the difference between, let's say, a region here in red and a region in green or blue. And if you look at those at the color scale, scale on the lower left, you can see that the red and the green and the blue parts aren't really that far apart on those values. So whether you're on a green region or a blue region, the difference might really be just two parts per million. So our measurements don't just have to find gases that are already just present in very small amounts in the atmosphere, but we need to make sure that those measurements are accurate enough that we can tell the difference between various areas on the planet. And yeah, we have gone and actually done that. So we have built instruments, uh, put them on satellites and sent them into space to take measurements all over the place. <clears throat> these measurements are, these instruments, sorry, are extremely big and very expensive. So you can think of them as very, very high-tech optical instruments that have, you know, optical elements like a camera you would know. They have lenses, they have detectors like any digital camera has. Um, yeah, and when I say very expensive, I mean several tens of millions of pounds. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see a European satellite and a European set of instruments that the red arrow here is pointing to the location where the carbon dioxide instrument was located on this satellite that has been in operation for 10 years. And one of our really personal favorites is a satellite and instrument combination by the Japanese um, space agency. It was launched in 2009 and is still going strong and taking measurements. So our job really was to take measurements that are essentially measurements of reflected light coming off the surface of the Earth and take those measurements and turn them into useful quantities that scientists can then use to understand the carbon cycle on a global scale. So how does that work? How do we actually do that? How do we take those measurements and turn them into useful numbers? At the end of the day, we really just, for every single measurement location, we really just take a measurement and we build a little computer model atmosphere. And we start from the ground up, so we start with the surface, and this picture should just illustrate that we can take into account whether that measurement has been done at a mountaintop, somewhere in a valley, over the ocean. When it's over the ocean, we can take into account ocean waves, for example. We can take into account whether it was a dark forest or some light green, um, you know, lush grassland, for example. Because we're measuring light, we also need to have an idea of what did light look like that comes from the sun. And we think we have a pretty good idea of how that looks like. Yeah, and finally, we also need to put the instrument up there. So we need to know the particular geometry between measurement location, the instrument. We need to know how does the instrument react to sunlight under specific circumstances. And because those instruments have been measured in the laboratory before they were sent up to space, we also have a pretty good idea of that. As a final step, we also need to put in um, gases in our atmosphere. Oxygen, of course, always present. 
we need to know the humidity, so we need to understand water vapor in a given scene. And then we also need to put in various trace gases. So even though we measure CO2, we also need to have a good idea of how much CO2 is there in the atmosphere. And we know all that, we can do that using meteorological models, for example. And what we then do is essentially play a game of trace the light path. So we know where the instrument looked at, where the satellite was pointing at, um, we know where the sun is, and then we can do sort of simple-ish geometry and figure out the light path. Um, so you can think, well, this is simple enough, this is easy, it's just basic trigonometry. Unfortunately, it's not quite like that. Um, the reason why this is way more difficult than it really needs to be sometimes um, are these two guys, angry little cloud and um, layers of dust, for example. So what those two do is rather than having a simple, you know, straightforward light path between satellite, sun and the measurement location, this happens. So light can come in from the sun, it travels through the atmosphere, it interacts with gases, and that interaction really is how we can, we can extract the information of the trace gases uh, from those measurements. And that light will hit a layer of dust, for example, and it will bounce around, it will scatter between those dust particles. It might be thrown back to the surface of the earth. Um, it gets reflected up again. It might bounce around the dust layer, couple of times and then it escapes travels up it might hit a cloud and then it might get bounced around inside the cloud a few times um, and then it finally hits the satellite okay so how, do, how does light actually propagate through the atmosphere how does it interact with gases how does it interact with clouds and layers of dust and this is the answer um, Equations, lots of equations, very, very technical topic. Um, it is almost a research topic in itself. Can be quite interested if, if you're into it. Um, and again, a bit of tedious work. So let's instead look at a picture of a seal instead. Um, what I really want you to take away here is that in order for us to make those measurements useful and accurate, we really need to have a very good idea of the light path that light has taken from the sun through the Earth's atmosphere and then back into the instrument. And otherwise we cannot make sense of those measurements and we will get wrong answers and even slightly wrong answers will make scientists that take those measurements very angry because they will essentially ruin all of their calculations when they try to figure out those carbon uh, exchanges. The good news is really that these equations um, that are hidden between, between, uh, behind this nice animal, those are established or have been studied for many years now, which means we also have solutions to these equations. We know how to solve them. So both the equations and the solutions are established. And scientists like me, we can really go and just use ready-made software packages and then connect them to our computer models um, so we really don't need to think too hard about um, how to solve this mathematical problem. A PhD really is all about solving problems. So the question is, what was the problem in this case? It turns out that this part of the calculation, i.e. how to trace light through um, layers of dust and through clouds, is really slow. So doing this, for, for example, for one single measurement uh, using the straightforward routine type of calculation can take somewhere between two and three hours. Um, that alone doesn't seem like a big problem. Uh, we have computers, we have lots of them, and they're fast. You know, you do two or three hours of computations, that's fine. Unfortunately, these satellites take, take measurements, you know, 60,000, 100,000 or more for every single day, um, which means that in order for us to keep up with those measurements coming in from the satellite every single day. It means we have to run thousands and thousands of computers um, at 100% all day, every day, just to keep up with those measurements coming in. Maybe today 6,500 or even 10,000 doesn't seem like an awful lot if, if you have a little bit of background knowledge on these large-scale computations. 
Um, however, that is quite expensive. And definitely 10 years ago, this would have made routine data operations, you know, almost not feasible. Um, yeah, so again, people way smarter than myself have come up with various solutions on how to deal with this problem. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side, you see this jagged, spiky blue figure. This is indeed one of those actual measurements that, that the satellites take. And on the right-hand side, you can see a smooth orange curve. And using a bit of mathematical trickery, you can take this left-hand side image and you can turn it into a right-hand side image, into this smooth orange curve. Um, and those two are equivalent in many ways. So in terms of those light path calculations, those are equivalent. So it doesn't really matter if you, if you perform those calculations on the image on the left or on the image on the right. That doesn't really give you any kind of speed up or gains in computational efficiency. However, if you then look at the right-hand side image, just the fact that this image, this curve is very smooth, this allows you then to apply various mathematical tricks uh, so-called acceleration methods uh, that allow you to skip many, many calculations. So instead of, let's say, 3,000 of these calculations that you have to do for one of these measurements, uh, you can do 32, 64, or 100, for example. And skipping many of those calculations then allows you to do a single one of those measurements um, processed through your algorithm in a couple of minutes rather than uh, many hours. And the really difficult part, and which is what I spent, again, several years of my PhD experience on, was how do we skip those calculations, but how do we make this still accurate enough so that our measurements are still useful? Yeah, and again, after a couple of years, we've managed to get some very good results. We have managed to substantially improve on one of those acceleration techniques. Um, and we managed to publish what I believe was a very nice scientific publication and communicated our results to the scientific community. Um, research and science never really stop. So the question would be, well, where do we go from here? Uh, it turns out that even with these speed ups, computational effort is still a big bottleneck. Um, one real life example of this would be, well, for example, if you know a science team comes up with an idea and figures out a slightly better way of how, do you, how we deal with layers of dust. Of course, we want to go back to day one of that satellite and run all of those measurements through our algorithm again in order to have much better measurements and much better data for other scientists to use. And again, those are millions and millions of measurements and just rerunning our algorithms on those takes thousands of computers and they're running for months and months. And that costs indeed a lot of money. Um, and of course it takes time, which you know, neither of those are good things. And this problem just isn't gonna go away because next generation satellites and instruments will produce even more measurements. So there will be even more data. The question is, are there ways forward? Of course they are. We could always just work on the algorithms themselves and make them better and more accurate rather than faster. Uh, but along with those improvements, we could also make aggressive shortcuts. Um, we also need to be careful, of course, because we don't want to sacrifice accuracy. Um, another rather hot topic um, recently has become uh, the use of machine learning. So it's a bit of an iffy topic for us because even though we, we acknowledge that that is probably the way forward, it also means we have to give up on some of our physical intuition and trust a lot of computer science black boxes, which none of us really like to do. Yeah, so again, thank you to the University of Leicester and thank you to the um, college. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you. Okay, fabulous. So are we back to, uh, are we back to real life, real virtual life now, Kelly? Can you, can everybody hear me? Yep. Perfect. Yep. Peter, what can I say? An absolute study in, uh, in perseverance. That must have been a wee, just a wee bit stressful. Um, 
it worked in the end and it was definitely worth waiting for. Um, we've, we've, um, we've asked quite a few questions while we were ad-libbing, um, and messing around with the internet. So, um, we've got a few more minutes if people want to ask any few, a uh, few more questions. There's some, uh, there's some hands going there. Thanks for the presentation, Peter. Went amazingly. Uh, got here the exciting stuff. Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Well, you can read them yourself. Outstanding. Does anybody have any um, quick couple of questions that they want to ask? Uh, that they want to ask Peter. If you do, just shout him. Just jump in. Because if not, I'll just ask my question. Okay. So, Peter. Um, what, what's the, I asked the previous speaker about, you know, what's the real world, uh, takeaway message from this, um, from this piece of research? So it's, uh, I mean, what, what you've been doing is, is, is truly fascinating. And the way that you're using satellites and and computing etc etc to, to, to model stuff is truly exciting but what's the what's the you know the one big picture takeaway message from what you've been doing all right so when when these when these instruments were first designed um the the scientific question was a little bit different than it is now um back then it was really about understanding what does the Earth, Earth's carbon cycle truly look like? How does it respond to extreme situations? How does it respond to, you know, a steady state situation? Since then, um, people have, especially on a policy making level, have begun, you know, finding some interest in, in these, in these type of measurements, in these, in this type of science. And suddenly the focus has shifted on that level. People, you know, if, if you think about you know, something like the Paris Agreement. Um, nations are suddenly finding, okay, we need to understand not just the the natural carbon cycle, we also need to understand what what is the anthropogenic component. Um, the European Commission has spearheaded probably the technologically and in terms of cost most advanced um, carbon detection mission in history. Um, so in a few years, there will be satellites that measure them with better spatial temporal resolution than we've ever seen. And essentially, the goal is to detect carbon emission on, on, a, on a scale that can be used by nations. So it is not just finger pointing as in, you know, this coal plant, you're emitting way too much. And we can see this from up here. We don't need to trust your you know, your certificates and your own measurements and whatever you submit to your policymaker. Um, we've got satellites. We can actually detect this from above. And again, in order for that to make on, on a very basic and fundamental level, we need to understand, we need to make those algorithms work accurately. We need to make them work fast enough because there'll be millions and millions of measurements just being dumped onto ground stations every single day. And we need to have a fast turnaround. So within weeks, we need to be able to, to have those concentration measurements ready for public, for the, for policymakers and for any scientists who really wants to use those. Can I, can I, uh, nobody's going to ask any more questions. So I have one, one last one, if I may. So you kind of alluded to the fact that you would be able to use these measurements to say, um, you know, factory X, industry X is producing Y amounts of, of carbon dioxide and therefore policy needs to change. It. So how does that, in terms of size, I don't know whether you can answer the question, how does that come out in terms of size compared to what's happening in California at the moment with the wildfires? So um, presumably that there's going to be a, there's going to be a massive um, blip or spike around those fires, right? That, how, how big is that compared to what you will be looking at, at, you know, power plant X or Y? So the, the answer, I, I, I don't have numbers that I can now say, but of course, those are substantial. If, if three million acres of forest have been burned within a few months, that is, of course, a sizable disruption to the carbon cycle. It, it it can easily dwarf um, 
you know, big industries on, on regional and national and almost global scales. Um, and we also need to understand that, of course. Um, yeah, if, if, yeah, the, the one slide that I presented on, on the, on the natural carbon cycle is that the human contribution is small compared to the natural carbon cycle. If you take every single forest on this planet and look at how much carbon they emit compared to what we as humans emit, that's way more. But of course, the natural carbon cycle also takes up a lot of that. And there is an added difficulty to understanding the changes in the natural carbon cycle in order to make sense um, about what is the human contribution. Um, so what I said, you know, sort of in a hand wavy manner that we can just pick up um, the, the anthropogenic component is technically very difficult. Um, but for example, looking at, at things like industry and um, single big power plants and emitters, uh, that is something that we can do today. Um, but of course, there has to be more research done on, on decoupling sort of the natural and the anthropogenic component to this big system. Okay, so there is a question in the chat, and Mark Williams has also got his hand up. So if we can be, if you can be brief in your answer, we can get them both in. Yeah. So let's let's do the one in the chat first, as it came up first. This is from Fran, and then we'll ask Mark. So Fran's saying CO2 and stressed plants. Is this scenario going to exacerbate in the near future? What are the main challenges that you foresee in the near future? What will the impact of higher levels of CO2 on these measurements? What will be the impact? Um, sounds like a long question to me. Yeah. yeah. Higher, higher levels of CO2 for the measurements, not an issue um, at all. The um, stressed plants, um, yeah, those are more of a local and regional issue. Um, a, a bit of stressed forest here and there doesn't make an awful lot of uh, an impact in terms of the, the global level. So that's not going to change much of, of the global composition, again, on a global scale. Um, challenges, the biggest one is, yeah, make policymakers listen. <laughs> Mark. So, P Peter, mine is a follow-up question to that, really. Um, cities um, where most economic activity goes on on planet Earth and um, city population is growing very, very rapidly. It will be going up towards 70 percent at the end of this century, which means that CO2 emissions are generally going to go up very, very significantly. Now, if you, if you can model CO2 outputs at a city level, how can you potentially use that to, to, to show policymakers that they need to start thinking about developing a circular economy? whereby the CO2 is captured in some way and not released to the released to the atmosphere. Sorry, that's a long winded question. It's not quite what you're after, Dave and Peter, but it's fascinating subject. Yeah. Um, so just so the newest measurement, uh, so the newest instrument that we've sent out that is on board the ISS actually tries to figure out um, the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations on a city scale level. Um, it has a special measurement mode where it's sort of um, you know, it scans over city a couple of times. Um, so we can take measurements on city scale. It is very difficult to understand what is the actual output of the city. You can imagine if you have a city that's right next to large forests and turns out there's a couple of those. Um, just that the fact that those forests exhale carbon dioxide and depending on wind direction, depending on season and a specific day, it can just be that that your city signal, i.e. The, the CO2 emissions that come from the city, are just being blown away and completely dwarfed by what comes out of nearby vegetation. Um, on a policymaking level, again, I'm not I'm not sure how you know. I think if I if I had a good way of of uh, you know getting to policymakers and to listen to them, um, you know, probably Nobel Prize my way, but the fact is that if you ha if you have solid science, if you have solid numbers, um, I do believe that 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 is definitely some kind of a leverage that that one could use um, to at Thank least you. get to people. Okay, 
I think um, I think we should call the session to uh, to a close now. Um, uh, it's been a real pleasure to host this, even with a little blip in the middle. But hey, perseverance, that's what it's all about. We're all uh, we're all researchers and we all understand that things don't always go to plan. But it worked out in the end. So um, uh, if this was if this was a, a normal series of presentations, I'd be saying let's uh, let's retire and have a glass of wine and some of the university's dreadful nibbles. So you can still have a glass of wine, and I'm sure the nibbles will be far more interesting. So um, thanks again to both of you, um, and um, I give you your doctoral and overall lecturers. So um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night, Lester. Thanks.